a chink more and not much more. <laughs> so we're going to begin our meeting tonight. Um, because it's an organizational meeting, I will open the meeting and then we'll go through some steps and then we'll go to nominations for board chair, vice chair. So first of all, I want to welcome new board members. As we just said, it's the first time we've had a full uh, plate of representatives from all of our towns, which is really exciting. Just going to go through the election results that are in your board packet. Lynn Ewing will continue from Barnard for two years of a three-year term. We have Laura Bowers from Bridgewater, remaining two years of a three-year term. Ryan Townsend, welcome Ryan, remaining year of a three-year term. Katie Reed, remaining year of a three-year term. Ann Carl is a new three-year term. Josh Lynn, new three-year term, welcome. Anna Sessa, new three-year term. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Back. Of course. Uh, Sam D. Natale, who is now our veteran board member, a uh, new year, uh, new for a three year term. And then John Williams is new for a three year term. So, welcome everyone. And again, very excited. Lydia. Oh, oh, and Lydia, I'm sorry, Lydia Law, not to be forgotten. Uh, new three year term. Welcome, Lydia. Okay. Yeah. We are going to wrap. Sorry. sorry. Anne is not here this evening, but she, we welcome her. And she's a new three-year term. So welcome everyone. And again, great that we have full representation of our 18 members mm -hmm. on the board. So the um, we are here to first elect a board chair. So we select the board officers for the WCSU and WCUUSD boards. The elected will hold the same position on both boards. A board chair and clerk are legally required. A vice chair is best practice, but not legally required. So um, I will uh, call for nominations for the board chair position. Yes. I'm the chair person. I'll second. So any other nominations for board chair position? Not hearing any other nominations, um, I call the question. All in favor of Carrie Bristow as board chair, say aye. 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 Thank you. Any opposed? Not hearing any opposed. I'd like to say welcome and congratulations here at Bristow to as our board chair again. Thank you very much. All right, I will now take over the meeting and um, we'll start with nomination for vice chair. Bryce? I'd like to nominate Ben Ford. I'll second. Seconded by Anna. Any other nominations? All right, I'll call the question. All in favor of Ben Ford for vice chair, please say aye. 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 Okay. All right. Congratulations, Ben. And we do need a clerk as well. Ben had been filling that role. I think Ben's going to have a very full plate with finance and buildings and things like that. So I would like to know if there is somebody who would nominate someone to be a clerk. And Rainy, could you just quickly describe the position of clerk and what it involves? Sure. Um, it would be taking minutes if your recording secretary wasn't here or uh, no meeting did not happen after um, a, an executive session. If I should depart for a lengthy executive session. Um, and in all honesty, I can't think of a lot else that a clerk would do at the moment. Can I um, nominate Matt Stout? I'm sure he probably does is giving me a look right now, but I'm 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 on video, so I can't see. <laughs> is there a second? Yes. I accept. We get a chance to accept. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and Bryce second. Bryce second. Okay. Any other nominations? All in favor of Matt Stout as clerk, please say aye. 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 Right. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> May it work, will it be light? Um, okay. Um, at this time, I'm going to ask Sherry to show us a document that Rice kindly provided to us. 
um, regarding the uh, different committees and working groups. And it, I thought it was a helpful uh, visual. And Terry John is, is okay, John. Yeah, All right. Yeah, we need a big room for it. Yeah, we can move this way. It's not a it's not a round table. Yeah, everyone gets a seat. We have space down here if anybody wants to scoot down and yep. down to the corner. Here we go. Either side. Thank you. We're making room for You're so accommodating. <laughs> Wait till you see what we have next. <laughs> we already voted you. Yeah, <laughs> Welcome, John. Welcome. So we just selected the, um, the chair, myself, Ben Ford as vice chair, and the clerk. Uh, will be Matt Stout, and we're just taking a look now at the various um, committees and working groups that board men members are encouraged to um, choose to be on. Will there be a chance for all of the board members to introduce themselves? Sure, that's, that's a great idea. Sure. Would you like me to start? Yes, go right ahead. <laughs> I'm Anna Sessa, uh, Reading, Vermont. Been on the board two, three years now. Uh, it's a labor of love to those newcomers. Uh, we're really welcoming you all the year. Excited to have you. And finance committee. And, and I'm on the finance committee, that's correct. And I'm Elliot Rubin from Plymouth, and I'm beginning my second year, and I'm on the policy committee. Uh, Matt Stout, a representative of Woodstock, um, formerly policy committee, but I'm transitioning to buildings and grounds. I'm Marianne Ralph, I'm also in Woodstock, and I am new. I'm John Williams, also in Woodstock, and I'm also new. I am Laura Bowers. I'm from Bridgewater. I've been here almost a year. I'm on the finance committee. I'm Ben Ford, represent Woodstock. I think I'm in going into my fifth year, and I'm on finance and the new bill working group. Ryan Townsend from Bridgewater, and I'm new. Josh, I'm the member from the second time on board. First two, this is the first three year term. I'm Katie Reed from Killington. It's been almost a year since I've worked. Um, and I'm on Belize and Ground. Uh, Bryce Samuel, representing Bernard. I've been here since the board's inception, I guess, and uh, currently on negotiations in Buildings and Grounds. Um, I'm a home in Corsi. I'm a student representative. Um, I'm a sophomore <laughs> at the high school. Um, I'm Ada Giovella. I'm also a student representative, and I am also a sophomore at the uh, high school here. We'll be recognizing you a little bit later. All right, and anybody online who would like to um, introduce themselves, please. Sure, I can. This is Corinne. I, I'm a, I'm a little bummed. I I uh, we have this um, screen sharing, so I didn't actually get to see all the new people introduce themselves. I can't see anybody in there. So, um, but maybe eventually I'll get to know everybody. But anyway, I'm Corinne Park. I'm uh, one of the reps from Barnard. Um, and I guess this is my second year on the on the full board. Yeah, this is uh, Bob Crean. I'm a representative of Pomfret, been on and off again on the board and a longtime meeting goer. Uh, I'm also on building grounds. Uh, so yeah. uh, I'm I'm Sam Di Natale. Um, I described as the veteran. <laughs> Board member, I'm not sure how I feel about that. But um, I think this is my seventh, year, sixth or seventh year. I don't know. It, I've lost count. Um, studying my third, another third year term, uh, Woodstock graduate and Woodstock resident. All right, Adam. I'm Adam Amley from Reading. Um, Bryce, or I don't know how, I think I was, I joined at the same time as you, so whatever date that was, uh, and I think I'm in my final year of my term, so one more year, and I'm the former chair of the negotiations and iron. All right, Lydia? My name is Lydia Locke, and I represent Pomfret, and I think I've been on the board for about a year now. And Ray? I'm Ray Rice from Pittsfield, Vermont, and I just got reelected uh, three more years. I've been 12 years on the Pittsfield Board of Education so far. 
All right, thank you. Thank you all for doing that. So on your screen, uh, those on the screen at home um, and also here, we have uh, the three uh, boards and we informally moved negotiations, hiring and retention to a working group status because it does not meet all the time because it's only during negotiation times. So you can see a little bit about the work of each um, boarding com uh, committee and working group. And um, I think tonight, because some of you are brand new here, you may want a little time to consider which um, committee or working group you might like to be in. So I will pass this paper along. And if there is a specific one that you're interested in, uh, Ben and I will make those appointments uh, soon. Um, but if you'd like to uh, float a little bit and go to some of these committee meetings before you make a decision, that's another option you have. We do need um, some members for uh, some of these groups because of some changes and people who went off the board. So also on the website, you can also go there and it has a description in the similar group description is here and has the current people who are on those um, committees um, and working groups. So if you want to see who else is on these, you heard some of it tonight, but it went by fast. So if you're sure you want something and we can work it out for you, we will do the appointment. So I'm just going to pass it along. But if you want to wait or give it a day or two, um, I might reach out to you or Ben might reach out to you and say, we do need somebody or two people for this one. Would you be willing to serve on it? Um, because we want to get that straightened out quickly because the committee meeting is next Monday. And so we would like you to be able to go to those meetings there again. Most of those do meet um, via Zoom because it's different groups. Once in a while, people come here as well to meet. but. Um, that's up to your, your committee and working group to figure that out. And I sometimes float around to different meetings from time to time, and any chair can request that Ben or I uh, or one of us come, or Sherry might be invited to come, or somebody else from the administration because of whatever's being discussed might need um, a, a different voice to it and more information. Is, so. is it an opportunity that our student representatives could join as well? I think so. one is already interested. One has already been Attempt. invited. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Owen. I just wanted to make sure that they knew that it was an opportunity. Yes, for Owen has been invited to call CNU's accepted. Correct. And Aiden can think about it. And, um, you know, and again, if you feel like this is the fir my first year, I want to learn more before I commit, that's fine too. We can appoint at any time. In, in the year. So it doesn't have to be just this week, um, this meeting. Okay. Gary, yeah. um, I like Gary, if you want to send this out to board members after, just because if you go to the last slide, I, I, I try to just make it, I mean, here you can see the membership, oh, too, but like the flow, and if you go to the next one, Sherry, well, one of the reasons we created this a few years ago was just, I think it's worth everybody just taking a quick peek because it kind of it helps you understand what the different roles are of those things, you know, they have the work, the working groups might be charged by a committee to do something and they make a proposal for a committee and then that goes back to the full board, which then asks Sherry to do something and she might have to tell her team, you know, there's kind of a kind of a flow of information. So, you know, it's worth taking, I think, 10 minutes to explore it when, when you're thinking about which thing you want to be on to and what you might be doing. I will send it out to everybody because Bryce sent it to me. So it is helpful because the groups the working groups and the committees advise the school board of their work and the school board together as a group approves these things so that we can make recommendations in these groups, but we don't make final decisions. Um, so that's that's the purpose of these groups. And that's where a lot of the work gets done for the specific needs like the policy committee, the budget, um, the negotiations, and all of those things have their tasks that they do. So, all right, well, thank you. Thank you for providing that. Um, uh, Bryce, it, I found it very helpful when you sent it. Okay, so I think we'll move along to the um, discussing and adopting a code of ethics. I did photocopy um, these papers. They are also, there's a copy of this in your packet. So if we can pass that along, pass that along. Sure. we'll find it in your packet right in there. Um, 
This is the Vermont School Board Association Code of Ethics for school board members. Uh, most of us have signed it uh, in the past, and I'm asking that you would take it and sign it as well, and you can um, give it to, to me, or you can give it to um, Sharon and Marina. We just keep those on board, but it does uh, it's worth reading through because it does talk about the way that we uh, work as a board um, and that we work together, that we also can uh, voice our own opinions and views, but we work uh, with respect and treat um, our board members and administrators in school and the, uh, with respect as well as the public with respect. Yes. Are we going to adopt it as a board? Today or that's what we're discussing. Yes. Okay. So I'll, I'll move to adopt that school. Yeah, second. Okay. Is there a discussion around adopting the code of ethics? If you're on Zoom, it would be super helpful if you did raise your hand. Okay, Karen, I guess I'd just point out a few of the features of sure. the policy. We've had past ethics policies and some of the things, the reasons why they're important are some pretty um uh, pretty central tenets to board membership, and that's like you don't um, take action on your own on behalf of the board as a board, not as individual members. You know, if an individual, for instance, student like, given an order to uh, a school employee, right? You take actions as a group, promotions. Um, you don't have conflicts of interest. If you have a, a personal, like a family relationship or somebody, a relative or someone else, maybe a financial interest, those things um, could cause a board member to, to sit out of board actions, right? And then uh, confidentiality is another aspect of the policy that's incredibly important for board members. Just wanted to call out some of the features. Okay. Thank you. Any any other comments on the code of ethics? All right. So if you would read through it um, when you have a chance and, and sign it, if you're ready to sign it tonight, you can just pass them along to Sherry. <laughs> sure. She'll be the keeper of that. Um, we need to vote to that. We probably do. I mean, you can sign it regardless of that. the motion. She's not going to hurry. I guess I have a question. If, if once it's adopted, do we have to adopt it every year? I think it deserves a review every year. I mean, so. it's changed now. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. But we may need to add things as we that it be adopted every year. It's their recommendation, but okay. I know. All right. All those in favor of adopting the code of ethics, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. <laughs> Any opposed? Okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, we also have in the packet the um, meetings, a list of meeting times. Here. Are there any more packets hanging on? Is, um, is there a Google calendar that has all the meetings that we can just like put onto our devices anywhere? No. No, it's on the website. It's on the website. You have to go there and then you would have to but, put it in. But there is a link on the website for Google yes. Calendar. Yes, and physical calendar. Yeah, it's a physical calendar. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. No problem. All right. Note that mostly it's first and third um, Mondays, except when there's a, a holiday or a day out of school or um, a vacation. All right. We also have our posting places where these things are posted. And um, I guess we are approving both the board meetings and the committee meetings, which is on the next page, I believe. We have committee meetings. Mm -hmm. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the board meeting schedule and designated posting places and new papers of record. I'll second it. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And is there a motion to adopt the meeting, uh, the, the committee meetings? So moved. Second. Okay, thank you, Bryce and Anna. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you very much. That has passed.
And we need to appoint a delegate for statewide health insurance. I think, Adam, you have done that in your past, correct? <laughs> it looks very enthusiastic. <laughs> Love the enthusiasm. There. It was a very big, it was a big ask. I was able to pull it off. I think I did absolutely nothing. So okay. either I'm either I missed something or there isn't much responsibility associated with it. <laughs> yeah. Would somebody like to make a motion for like a nomination or a, a yes, a nomination? Sorry. Adam, are you willing to try at it again? I will nominate Adam. Second. Okay, thank you, Bryce. All in favor, say aye. Aye. All right, Adam, thank you so much for your hard work on that. I'm sure you give us a full report whenever you are tapped. Thank you. All right, is there a motion to adjourn the reorganizational meeting? Can I make a motion? Second. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 All right, thank you. Okay. Um, we have um, a scheduled appointment to start around seven. Is that right? Do you want to call to order? Yeah, I will. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. I'm I think, and I think Allison's here with most of our students. We have some of our other students present. So I think I think we're ready to go. Okay. okay. All right. Is, um, I'm going to call the meeting to order at 6.53. Are there any amendments to the agenda? Uh, correct. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask um, about something, and I'm not sure I see any place on the agenda to ask about it involving or relating to um, the new vice principal um, position that has been proposed slash perhaps advertised and uh, sort of pro uh, procedures leading up to that. Can we talk about the superintendent? Yeah. yeah, can we talk about that during the superintendent report? Yes, perfect. Great. Okay, and I, I'm going to add a um, that during the during the reports, the student reports, I will be um, asking for a motion to appoint our student representatives as official non-voting members of the school board. So I just wanted to make sure that I don't forget that. All right. Okay. All right, so uh, at this time we have public comment. Hi, hi, Jenny. My name is uh, Joni Kennedy. For those of you who don't know me, I worked in the school for 28 years. And um, I'm here tonight to address the board and the district. Um, I'd like to ask what the district's current expectation and protocol is around training frontline workers in the district safety and security policy and our district's emergency operation plan procedures. Um, public comment. Yeah, I, since it's public comment, generally we just listen to questions and concerns, and then it may come up again when we're out of public comment, possibly. Okay, so yeah. um, I'd like to know also who is responsible for providing that training and making sure um, frontline workers have a copy of these policies and plans. Um, Frontline workers need our school plan and policies along with proper training in them to give workers the confidence and understanding to respond if needed. Understanding our rules and policies and plans as it relates to safety and security is essential. And I can respond during the, it's in my six weeks. Okay, very good. So um, I tried to jot down the things, but um, if there's something that's not said, um, I'll allow you to 
ask for clarification only. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. At this time, uh, we will have a presentation on the implementation of the WCSU equity, inclusion, and diversity policy. So if you remember back in January, Twin Park asked us where we were in terms of the implementation. And I thought it was a great opportunity. There are many examples across the district, but I have been in some classrooms and spoken with some teachers. And so I've asked that um, some of our teachers, some of our students to present on the work that is being done and some of our other directors. So I'm going to share, let's do this, right? My screen, oh, that's not what I want. So I'm just that one. Oh. You may have to unshare first. There we go. Okay. So now that I get back to you, it should come up. Yes. There we go. All right. So tonight we're going to look at, if we remember, um, it was a two year process for the board to approve and accept a equity, inclusion, and diversity policy. We began that process in May of 2022. And the policy begins with these words, Windsor Central Supervisory Union and its member districts are committed to creating and maintaining a positive and inclusive learning environment where all students, especially those who are currently or historically marginalized, feel safe, included, welcomed and accepted and experience a sense of belonging and academic success in a safe and caring learning environment. So tonight we're going to we will hear from the Prosper Valley sixth grade class regarding their equity experience. We're going also going to hear from our students who are the members of the Students Advisory uh, Superintendent Student Advisory Council on their work on a student manifesto for equity. What are, are you guys also... watching? I can't get in to my computer to get it to work. Those are students. <laughs> Brenda, can you uh, I just said, yeah. thank you? <laughs> and then we're also going to hear from administrators on the late start Wednesday, teacher and staff training and projects. And finally, the administrators review of equity on grading. There we go. So first, um, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Allison Green and her class who are going to speak to the work that they have done in terms of equity. Oh, Allison, we're, you're on mute. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Yeah. All right. I'm um, Allison Green. I teach sixth grade at uh, the Prosper Valley School. Um, I'll talk a little bit about sort of the background about what we did. And then I have four, I believe, students here to talk about their experience. Um, so I've always, since uh, probably the past four years, done it. Um, unit on the civil rights movement to get kids sort of just familiar with the history. Um, and I've always wanted to do this book, March. Um, it's by Senator John Lewis. It's about his experiences during the civil rights unit. Um, it's a fairly difficult mm -hmm. at times book. It's very honest. It has some language that kids have to grapple with and understand. Um, and I guess when I did read the diversity and equity policy, it kind of gave me the push to like try this out with a class. So um, the sixth graders are here to tell you a little bit about what we did. Um, sixth graders, if you can just, unlike me, make sure your microphone is on, I'll let you guys take it away. Uh, so one of the first things we learned about was uh, Rosa Parks, which how she was sat in the front of the bus and she was arrested for it because people of color weren't allowed to sit in the front of the bus at the time and they had to all sit in the back. Uh, we also learned about the Little Rock Nine, which was uh, the first nine people of color to join or to be integrated into uh, all white school at the time. Uh, it was a high school, I believe. Well, we also learned what primary documents were. Uh, a primary document is something that's like 
from that time period, like a newspaper article or a picture that was taken at that time. So, yeah. You can go on to the next slide, Jerry. Okay, so uh, one of the next things we learned about was the lunch counter sit-in. Um, and so in 1960 in North Carolina, four college students who were black went to a lunch counter. Uh, and this was their first trial. Um, and then they did this like two more times. Uh, and each time it got a little bit bigger. And then on, like it was a, they did three trials to make sure it wasn't like gonna be awful. <laughs> um, and then, uh, it like started to go to a lot of different uh, lunch counters. Um, and so it like the, like the real protest was nonviolent. Um, and the point of that was like, so if they got thrown in jail, uh, they like, they would just fill it up instead of like, and then like all the people who actually needed to be in it, uh, like they couldn't. Um, and it spread across the South and it wasn't just black people who did it, uh, everyone did it. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, it worked. So, yeah. So we also learned about the Freedom Riders. Um, this was a test, basically a test starting in Washington DC going to the South. There were people of all different races and all different ages. They basically just went on this bus down to the South and nothing happened in the North, but then we learned that since there's a lot of segregation in the South, that people were unhappy about this because they were, all the races, they were sitting wherever they wanted. So it got violent and people bombed the bus and then there was violence outside of the bus and they ended up in jail, but they, yeah. You can go on, Jerry. All right, so we read this book called March, and it was by John Lewis, who was the guy who experienced, like he was involved in the civil rights movement, and that was pretty cool. And I also really liked how the book was in black and white, and here are some of the pictures that our class found interesting. Yeah. You can go on, I think. Um, so we sort of polled some kids after reading the book. Here are, we just have uh, some quotes from all the kids in the class that read it. Um, I'll, I'll read these, you can read along. I found it interesting that they never gave up even after, after they were beaten and thrown in jail. I found it interesting to learn about how much courage the Freedom Riders had. I like learning how people came together to do something important. I didn't know how long discrimination lasted after slavery was stopped. I was shocked that they would blow up a bus just because mm -hmm. someone with a different skin color was riding it. I found it interesting to learn about how people could only vote if they passed a test and they could not get proper schooling to pass the test. You can go to the next one. Um, we have some more. I'll let you guys read these on your own. Um, Liam, do you want to finish it off? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, to conclude all that, uh, I feel like it was important to learn about the civil rights movement and just history in general, uh, because harsh topics like this really helps us learn about our country and our country's history without sugarcoating it, uh, even though that there was like some harsh actions or language in the book. Uh, I feel like since we're in sixth grade, we can handle that. And it's important to learn about that kind of stuff just without sugarcoating it and just learning about our country and our history. Thank you guys. Thank you, Allison. And thank you to your class. I'm so excited they were able to come tonight. Thank you guys for having us. Any questions I can probably answer or if you need to move on. I would like to just say thank you, Ms. Green, and your students. I have Liam, Chloe, Lucy, and Andrew. Thank you all so much for showing up. Um, you're so brave and so welcome to join us in the future. Thank you. Thanks.
Yes, thank you very much from the board um, for the time you put in learning and also sharing that with us in our meeting tonight. Yeah. All right. Yeah, starts this up. I don't know if she's even here. Yep. So I'm sure you what she is. Yes. Okay. Let's see, Farron, do you want to start with the opening slide? I can do it in a dual meeting. I can do it. Aaron's in a dual meeting. I can do it if you want me to, or you can do it. Go for it, Ella. Okay. So we are the Woodstock Union High School um, Superintendent's Advisory Council slash Social Action Club. I don't know which slideshows you can see, but um, there's like, I have a different one up, but we, um, had a organized student leadership summit on social action and we created a manifesto with a bunch of ideas and goals working on equity and that's what we're here to show you all tonight. So we made this document which you have in front of you um, which is our, our student manifesto on equity um, and basically as you can see up there it's uh, very good it's it's just it's it's drafted from raw data that we collected at our leadership summit in October. So we did a lot of workshop based kind of activities between about 100 students that attended. Um, and we literally on like sticky notes gathered their thoughts and over the past couple of months with a lot of work specifically from Farron and Ella um, and a lot of members of the Social Action Club, they turned it into this beautiful little pamphlet. So the goals for our work back in October where we gather a large group of Vermont students and we're hoping to broaden that that impacts in the near future and and grow to other other schools and other districts and more students within our own. Um, we want to promote a culture of equity and awareness at our high school, which is what a lot of work uh, is done towards in the social action club at the high school. Um, and we want to bring a focus on student voice to uh, to school and district policies. So a lot of this document focuses on critical conversations. And what we mean by that are important conversations between students or between adults and students um, that are maybe uncomfortable, but, but necessary. How we can approach that delicately, but also effectively. Um, and we want to create a guidebook or a manifesto, which is what we've done here. See you. Um, it can't be. It's fine. Nice. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I'll um. So basically, the the process. This is the start of um, uh, our process to uh, draft this manifesto in this document uh, to be shared to uh, a greater audience. We started on October fourteenth, twenty twenty two, which was the beginning of this year. We hosted a student leadership summit, which uh, was organized by both the super. Intendant Advisory Council, if I have the name right, and uh, the Social Action Club. Uh, and the big idea of the summit was it was a group and team focused uh, event where students led conversations where we brainstormed um, different ideas. Uh, we did workshops and activities, and they were surrounded by the central ideas about equity and inclusion and how to make our school environment more equitable and inclusive. And uh, from these conversations and these workshops, we were able to collect feedback and synthesize this input into a single easy access document, which is right in front of us. I go ahead. Um, so with the data we collected from the summit, we then uh, kind of collaborated those ideas um, and synthesized them over many uh, weeks. We did it with, um, in the Social Action Club, we did it with the Superintendent, uh, Superintendent Advisory Council. Um, just to kind of put some finalized details, we were going to make some edits, um, of just anything from, you know, synthesizing to editing to, you know, making it look pretty. Um, and we, when we came up with this document, um, our main purpose for it was to be used for future policy making and norm changes in our community and possibly to inspire other communities to do the same. And uh, it will be made available to other schools 
and we will be presenting this our work to the Vermont Superintendents Association, uh, among other audiences. Let's have Ella. Ella, do you want to do the Why Student Voice um, and that, that slide? I can do this one now that I'm back. Sorry um, about the first slide. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so the first two questions that we addressed in our manifesto um, were why student voice and what are the hopes and needs of students? And so this was all synthesized again from the sticky notes from the leadership summit. And within our large bubble of why student voice as a um, part of our manifesto, I believe it's the second or third page. Um, we were talking about emphasizing the value of student input for school policies. Um, you can see a bunch of things um, a bunch of like a list of statements about why student voice is important and why it should be considered in a, in a lot of school decisions. And then the second question, what are the hopes and needs of students was a distilled list of expressed student needs. Um, we weren't able to include all of the ones on the sticky notes, but we did try to get the main idea um, that students expressed were their main hopes and needs um, in our school community. Okay, our second two questions for our total of four were what are some engaging phrases that can be used for having critical conversations and what are some strategies and notes for having critical conversations? So these two questions are really focused on how can we make these conversations work? So the first one is really focused on sensitive and aware prompts to start these difficult conversations and then make people comfortable in them from the get-go. And then the second question was to focus on an outline for a respectful and productive talking about these things, civil discourse, um, really making the norms for having these conversations standardized. That's the all the points you can see on the right. Um, there's a whole bunch of them for making these conversations really productive. So Leah, take us home. Leah, do you want to take us home? I, I kind of forgot about you. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. Uh, <laughs> no, that's OK. Um, Okay, yeah, so um, what we've been working on now um, as time um, coming out of the Leadership Summit and creating the manifesto is expanding the Leadership Summit to other schools and other areas around Vermont. We're doing, doing some really exciting work with that with um, South Royalton and other schools. Um, so what we're working on is publishing the manifesto um, now that we've completed it. Um, for administrators and students across the region to uh, read and, and talk about. So we're continuing to foster a culture of awareness and equity across our schools. That's the, uh, the ultimate goal. And to further incorporate student voice into decisions that are made, um, yeah, just in general. And so, um, this group of students and two of our educators have submitted a proposal. They will present at the Vermont Superintendents Association in May. They've also been asked to present uh, with Dr. Lavelle Brown to a group of administrators and teachers across the state of Vermont. And they've also submitted a proposal for a national presentation in St. Louis next September. So we're very excited, figured out how we could pay for it. We have to go. So that would mean that the five students, if they're available, could um, you know, fly to St. Louis and have a presentation. I think it is really commendable, the amount of work, and I, they're really understating what they did. They organized the entire event. They booked it with the Killington Grand, transportation, food, agenda, facilitated, Carrie was there, facilitated the session, brought Dr. Brown in. And then from those notes independently with the Social Action Club and this group of five students created this document. And it was based on a document that I found in Washington State, but they made it their own. And I think their work is just really important. Sure. Thank you guys. Their next step and the district was they will, they will be training the faculty and staff at the high school, middle school, on the application of this document. Um, and so hopefully I have a new body of work for them for next year, but we'll just one step at a time because you, they get tired after a while. So. But it's very exciting. Thank you. <laughs> so um, Jen Staten, we've got the, all the Statens here tonight. Jen Staten will present um, and Audrey Richardson 
regarding um, the professional development that the teachers and staff have been engaged in. So Hi, Robert. everyone. Jen Staten here, Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment. Uh, new board members, you'll be hearing from me later. Um, I just wanted to frame a little bit about the equity work, one aspect of equity work that's happening uh, across the district. Um, the late start Wednesdays, so the days when students come to school a little bit later, once per month, are really important for our equity work. Uh, this slide here sort of frames uh, those late start Wednesday PD sessions for you a little bit. The goal of those Wednesdays is to promote equity, inclusivity, and efficacy of our teachers. And we wanted to make sure our teachers had some voice and choice in how they engaged with that equity work. So they could pick entering through instructional models with universal design for, for learning, uh, through racial equity, or through our portrait of a graduate in deeper learning. And we have um, three different people facilitating those strands, but within those strands, we had options. Teachers could take a 101 course on the topic taught by somebody, or they could engage in their own learning if they wanted to, picking a book or connecting with a colleague. We wanted to make sure that teachers engaged in a level that made sense to them and allowed them to uh, have voice. Um, and Audrey Richardson is here. She is facilitating the central strand there on racial equity. And what she's going to do is talk about that particular strand tonight. Next slide. Thanks, Jen. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Audrey Richardson, and I'm the MTSS equity coordinator, um, mostly in the high school, middle school, but I also work in partnership with the elementary schools. Um, I'm also a lecturer at the University of Vermont, where I teach graduate courses on uh, race and racism, culturally responsive approaches to literacy and literature, and a bunch more sort of literacy offerings, depending on the semester. Uh, this year, I've been helping Jen, as she mentioned, um, with the Late Start Wednesdays by coordinating the equity strand. Um, the strand focuses mainly on equity and anti-racist efforts in our district, but it also explores historic, other historically marginalized groups, such as students living with economic challenges. Um, like the other Wednesday PD offerings, the equity strand has three sort of internal options. Um, the first being kind of that, as Jen described, that information download or 101, uh, which this one is taught by me. Um, so it's called Equity 101. Um, and you can actually access the slides. I hyperlinked them in there. If you have access to this slideshow, you can kind of just cruise through them and see some of the content that we've been looking at. Um, there's a lot of really rich dialogue and discussion that's been happening in these groups. And some of the major topics that we cover have to do with identity, conscious and unconscious bias, anti-racist perspectives and approaches and education as a mode for understanding the existence of systemic racism and institutional racism. Um, all of this in an effort to really better our practice. Um, we're also looking at um, the EID policy. Um, there is a separate group that's looking at that, but that's just woven into our work as well. Um, and then, of course, like in, in a in a practical practitioner based way, we're looking at like what are culturally responsive approaches to teaching and learning. Um, we also in this strand have crossed over with the deeper learning crew facilitated by Tim Brennan um, and this crew deeper learning is a, a term that uh, often sort of parallels the portrait of the graduate. Um, so Tim and I have been crossing our, our 101 groups over. Um, we were really inspired by the work of Linda Hammond Darling. Uh, she has a, a research out titled The Civil Rights Road to Deeper Learning. Um, so we've been working with her work and our group um, to really take a look at what does it look like when we intersect equity and deeper learning for an improved portrait of a graduate. Um, so the other offerings, as I mentioned, um, Sherry's group is looking at the policy um, and they've been really uh, working hard to kind of Pick things apart and just really think about what that means uh, to have a power, uh, such a powerful policy. Um, we also have a number of really um, thoughtful book group discussions going on. Um, we had a teacher approach us at uh, basically the inception of these late start ideas and this equity strand, saying we've we've experimented or we've had book group sessions with the book White Supremacy and Me. Can we run this in the late start? And we said, absolutely. That's a great use of our time. So we actually have two book groups that are facilitated by Vanessa Kramer and Anna Majessi. 
Um, one is virtual and one is in person so that folks have autonomy and have the ability to kind of choose what works for them. Uh, and then we have a couple of independent projects that are going on. Um, just to name a few, um, there's uh, book reads going on that are independent, the Ebony Column cast, um, and then there's research in uh, the intersectionality of race and the LGBTQ community. So those are just a, a few of the things that are going on in our equity strand. Um, thanks for giving me a minute to talk about that. Thank you. Thank you, Jen and Audrey. And the plan is that next year we will also we'll continue to focus on equity during our Late Start Wednesday. Jen is working now to develop a new framework for that. Um, again, looking at those three category areas and our choices with lots of faculty, uh, feedback from faculty and staff. And on us here tonight, and thank you for coming um, as one of our uh, leaders of one of the book groups. So one of the things in terms of, and so you can see we started the classroom, we moved to the high school and we're kind of moving out step by step. One of the things that the leadership team has been participating in, and so that's all the principals and directors, is doing a work with Dr. Lavelle Brown. And he is the person who came in and did some training, superintendent from Ithaca, New York. And so once a month, we participate in conversations with Dr. Brown. He brings in national representatives to have conversations on different um, aspects of, uh, uh, of the EID work. Um, and that's the group who um, our students will be presenting to next month. Um, one of the things that we are required to do as being part of this training is to develop a project. And so in talking to the administrators, we really felt that it was important to think about what are our grading practices that reinforce some of the um, inequities that are in our district. So we've read portions of grading for equity. Some of us have read the entire book. Um, we've had lots of conversations about what does our report card and grading system say about us and how we see equity. Um, one of the pieces that we're now looking at is how do we identify when a student has mastered a standard at the elementary level? So if a report card, the purpose of a report card, and we talked a lot, what's the point of a report card? Is to really communicate student progress around their uh, students' mastery of certain standards. And so our next step really is identifying what is the standard for first grade? What does it mean to be a third grader? And so that's a lot of work um, and something that we are now kind of framing out about how do we move that forward and how do we make sure that we are communicating both to students as well as to parents about how a student is progressing through the elementary schools. Um, the middle school and high school has had a, a grading policy that um, the policy committee is reviewing again. That's been in place for a number of years, but we really haven't focused and thought about how do we communicate for, you know, progress in an equitable way at the elementary level. Another piece that I, I, I wanted to add, and this is something that um, Raph and I have been working on. Uh, each year, we're asked to meet with members of the Dartmouth College uh, staff and faculty. And one of the topics that we uh, pitched to them is around popping the bubble. And what we mean by that is that in our communities, it's very hard to have experiences with diverse individuals. And so um, they have been interviewing, and I just, this is their summary, midsummer re report that they just sent to us yesterday, but they have been meeting with faculty and students and staff around what does it mean to pop the bubble? What's their experience? Um, what they noted and I thought was very interesting, students are passionate about issues that feel personal and our project aims to connect with the personal experiences to the local and global community context. Our initial designs provide the opportunity for students to learn, excuse me, and unlearn from each other by questioning their assumptions, their positionality, their values, and how they see the world. So we're hoping that by students having more diverse experiences, have a greater understanding for people who do not look like them or have had similar experiences. So it's been really exciting to do work with them and we're looking forward, they've pitched a couple of ideas on how to address this. They'll be coming back to after their spring break and giving us some other um, opportunities. Some of you will remember, we had a similar group come through and they offered a really interesting curriculum that we use with freshmen around having conversations about diversity and how we see each other. Um, and so this is a new piece of work that we're doing this year. So finally, where do we go next? So students are planning another uh, student leadership summit on social justice. 
We're looking at funding. I may have some ideas, but we're working on that. Um, and for some of you to know, we invite students from other districts. This last year, we had 15 students from Hartford. We had some representation from another school district. So hopefully it's not a Woodstock Union High School event, but really it's a student action group. And so we really want to diversify who students are. We have the presentation in May in Burlington. We will continue to focus on equity in our late starts. Um, there's plan for a teacher forum to showcase lessons addressing equity and problems of practice. That's what's coming out of my group, having a more open kind of continuum, something that's online. And then administrators will continue to address issues of equity and grading uh, and reporting practices. So that's our update. Do we have uh, Corinne? Open this up a little bit. Thanks. That's awesome. You guys are doing a ton. Um, I was, uh, so you went sort of from the classroom out and I was curious, um, cause I know it's part of the discussion we had when we were, when the policy was being developed, um, about the idea that, um, you know, the relationship to the community and the community as sort of the context for all this work is a, is a huge, important part of, of the work. Um, have you had thoughts about, um, you know, engagement with the community around these issues at all? We have not gone there. I know that the Social Action Club has had a lot of com community involvement and they've been having conversations. That has not been uh, a, the, the focus of the work of this year, mm -hmm. thus far. Jen? However, we did engage with the community quite a bit when it came to the district name change, which was for some equity reasons. So there, there has been a little bit of work there, but um, not a conscious effort to do an educational piece around it. Yeah. Yeah, I think just uh, something to keep in mind. I think it's pretty important, you know, as as the kids are being really exposed to all of this, you know, um, and just sort of maybe maybe thinking in a new way. Um, you know, the context of home environments and community atmospheres and stuff like that um, plays a big role as well. So, um, and I, I know that those conversations can can be hard and I'm not sure, you know, I don't have any particular ideas, but certainly something for you guys to be thinking about, I think. Thank you, good point. Any other comments? Yes, Bryce? I'd just like to say that it's a really comprehensive body of work. So thank you to students, administrators, faculty, everybody for, for all the work that you've put into. Well, I will say the faculty that I've spoken with are incredibly appreciative of the policy it passed by the board. It has, and many times, it, it, it's really hard and, and it's kind of what um, Owen and Aiden were saying, these are really critical conversations and they're really hard conversations. Um, our students from Dartmouth were talking about some teachers have noticed that some of those are radioactive <laughs> conversations. You don't know what's going to happen when you pose some of these hard questions. And so knowing that a policy is in place that administrators can you know, rely on, that faculty can look to has really been helpful. And I believe, and, I, and I've been told by the teachers, has really helped them in their work and you know, their willingness, like Allison was sharing, to, to put some more challenging things into our curriculum. So we are really appreciative uh, of that policy. And the time we took, I mean, it took two years to bring that forward and, and, and be approved and accepted. So thank you to the board. Yes, and I think that you produced here a very practical document around, you know, you, you've got to have a difficult conversation. Well, here's some starters. I mean, I think that's really practical and really useful. And I hope that, you know, these, these show up in everyone's classrooms so that either student or staff member can have these to help them as they frame questions around just even about my schoolwork and how it's going and why it's not going the way I might like it to go. Um, so thank you so much for all the things that you've done and for um, being, you two, especially for the last two years, have faithfully attended our meetings. And um, it's been great to have your voice. And uh, it was great to have the sixth grade voices um, because they'll be here next year. Um, so thank you so much for all of this work. It's not easy. <laughs> All right, um, then I think the next thing on our agenda is an international excursion approval. 
And I didn't see it. I'm not sure I saw it in the packet, but it's not in the agenda. It was a link. It was a link. Oh, it was a link. I did look at the link. Yes. And um, Anna, are you going to speak to it? I, I, yes. Hi, I'm Anna Majesty. I work at Woodstock Union Middle School and High School. I'm a Spanish teacher there. My colleague, um, Betsy O'Neill, is joining us um, via Zoom. Thank you for um, for having us here and, and looking at this exchange. Um, we are some history works hoping to revive the exchange program that has been a vital and rich part of our school, um, particularly the, the modern and classical language department where students don't just visit another country, but they actually host students and develop a relationship um, between a school in Spain in this case. And um, and are able to have the students come here in September and then visit them um, in the spring. So we are reviving that tradition. We're hopeful, and we're seeking more approval. And I'm here to answer any questions about that. Um, just a little bit of background. Um, the school that we are in contact with is a school that. Um, one of our mathematics teachers, Luis Villanueva, um, has contacts with. It's an incredibly um, diverse school, and um, it's in Madrid, the capital of Spain. And that school has already been engaging in sort of Skype exchanges with our students through Betsy O'Neill's class. Um, and um, Luis has already. Um, kind of garnered a lot of enthusiasm from that school to visit us here. Um, we've also had meetings with parents and there's a tremendous um, enthusiasm with parents and students to visit. So this one is very much focused on um, kind of that, I guess we were talking about um, exposure to diversity and this is a real world way for our students to develop oftentimes long lasting contacts with um, people from another country. So I'm here to entertain any questions that you might have. And our timeline is um, we are looking at hosting students from Spain. We already have 24 who are eager to hear from you all. <laughs> um, very interested in coming in September, early September. And our trip would take place most likely in April has been our tradition. Um, we had some conversation about February just in terms of like the academic um, rigors of April for some of the students um, who are interested in attending. Many of them take AP classes for and April's a crunch month. So um, we haven't got an exact date for the travel, although um, certainly April, April was the, the original and traditional time that we traveled. Garen, did you want to say something? Yeah, it's, hi, Garen Spell, principal. Uh, just want to speak to the program. You might feel like, hey, why am I hearing about this in March? I don't know, so soon. I just want you to know that the, the group has gone through all of our embedding within the school. So we have a committee that's set up to vet this program. Um, you have a, a copy that's not signed, but it's a signed copy for me from December. Um, so I just wanted to represent that with honor that group. They started this work in August and we're done this preparation so it's, it's a well well organized and, and gone through all the processes and we are talking about next winter right. not next week right <laughs> all right are there any questions from the board members discussion yeah, i thought i heard there was some approval being signed we... right okay. but if you have any questions that you'd like to ask to, 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 to make a motion to open up the discussion yeah, I guess what I don't know what, what approval entails. Are they looking for funding and looking just for an okay? School board approval. Move to approve. Yeah, I'll second if not, just to open up the discussion so that we can have yeah. discussion about it. All right. And uh Bob. Yeah, I just have a question about the possibilities of, of using this program to promote the possibility of getting some of the students from these partner schools to tuition into Woodstock High School for an entire semester or an entire year. That's all. 
Okay. Well, I know that has happened. Yeah. <laughs> it has. Yeah. The longer term, uh, yes. Um, Ray. Uh, yeah, I really think this is a great program. My daughter, Magnolia, went through it, uh, went to Spain a couple times. We're really good friends uh, with Anna. Still, we hear from Anna. She's come to visit us. Maggie's going back. So uh, this is a great thing, and we should do as much of this as we can. I highly, uh, highly applaud this. Okay. Are we ready to vote? Yes. All in favor of approving this uh, travel opportunity, please say aye. 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 I enthusiastically say aye. <laughs> thank you. All right. Thank you very much for taking your time to tell us about it. Um, okay. We now are going to move into our reports and we have a superintendent's report. Sure. Thank you. Uh, first, I want to recognize the girls' hockey team, the girls' snowboarding team and James Underwood, they're all state champions. Fantastic. I mean, we host such a large number of sports every year. Um, and it's never been the point of our sports program that I think of to have as many state champions as possible. It is really to make sure that every student has opportunities to participate in some kind of activity, explore lifelong restrooms, so when three, you know, two of our teams and one of our uh, Nordic individuals are recognized as a state championship, it's really exciting. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, another piece of work that uh, the leadership team is really excited about is, so I think I've talked at the previous board meetings out about the work in terms of literacy, the work in terms of math practices, and really the third leg of that stool is how do we use student time? What does the schedule look like? And so one of the opportunities that we have pursued through our ESSER funding is engaging with the work of Dr. Nate Levison um, to look at what are our practices in elementary school in terms of how much time do we dedicate to literacy? How much time do we dedicate to mathematics? If our goal truly is to hit 90% proficiency in literacy and mathematics by grade three, we have to be laser focused. For that to happen, we really need to make sure that when we have students in literacy, mathematics, we are really following best practices. So Nate came and I was amazed. And this is an individual who presents nationally. He typically works with school districts of 22,000 students. We just have over a thousand, um, but he was really excited. We've worked a little bit with him in the past. We are pursuing his practices in terms of our finances. Ben and others in this room who are in finance have looked at his book on smart schools, uh, smarter schools, smarter budgets. Um, and so he met with the leadership team last week for an hour and a half. Every single faculty member, staff member has been interviewed or every faculty member has been interviewed in the elementary school regarding how do we use our instructional time. So based on the training we did in best practices, interview with all the principals and directors, interviews with teachers, reviewing of our current schedules, reviewing of our policies, they will create for us a model schedule. And so that would be ready probably in May um, and he will be back to, Nate Levison will be presenting to the school board around his recommendations on how we use our time for all of our elementary schedules. So I'm very excited about that work. And again, this is an opportunity that we are able to pursue because of the ESSER money. So it's, it's been interesting. Um, one of the things that I've been very involved with in the last month is doing testimony to the Vermont House Education Committee and the Senate Education Committee We've done, um, we've done two presentations. One was on the lack of support we're feeling from our um, designated agencies. Those are the groups that provide mental health supports from across the state. Um, those are typically in Hartford, Springfield, and Rutland because of our location here kind of right smack dab in the middle. It's really hard to get supports for those mental health agencies. They're busy in Hartford, Springfield, and Rutland. And so for them to give the attention to us, it's been a challenge. We've heard some of the impact of that. Schools and teachers and administrators are really stepping into that. Um, and so we did present to the House Education Committee, or I did, and some other superintendents. Um, myself and Raphael Adamek presented around uh, P PCBs and PCB testing. Um, we really focused on uh, our, you know, our statement was if we had not received a moratorium on school facility funding in 2007, when the force the board first 
was concerned about the facility at the middle school and high school, if we had had the funding that was promised to us by legislation, we would have a brand new building right now and we wouldn't be wor worrying about PCBs and radon. So we made some very bold statements. Um, Raphael has his background in public health. We really pulled into that. Um, and we may see some significant changes in terms of uh, legislation and expectations around PCBs and testing. And really, let's focus on what's important, the 450 students who are now in our building right now, that they have systems that work every day. We had another problem today for Joe. He should go home and go to bed and hear way too much. So that was really exciting, uh, having that opportunity to speak to both the House Ed and the Senate Ed Committee on those topics. Um, and the lastly, we've been asked about our work on terms of full-time public pre-K. We are one of the very few districts in the state of Vermont that offer full-time public pre-K at all of our elementary schools. And I know there's some concerns about spaces. We're, we'll figure it out. But we, one of the challenges are that even though we have over 100 pre-K students currently enrolled in our district, we only receive funding for half of that student. So you get for, you know, for kindergarten through grade 12, we receive full funding. And even though our pre-K classrooms require a licensed teacher and a paraeducator, we only we receive less than half funding. And so one of the things that I've been asked to testify on and to uh, advocate very strongly is that we receive full funding um, and that we are now a model for districts across the state around how do you offer full-time public pre-K. One of the fears is that our private partners will um, no longer be needed. And, and Carrie and others can speak to, that is not the case. We, even with our full-time public pre-K, our partners in the private domain are needing to expand. And even then, we don't have enough um, um, you know, slots for all the demands we have in our communities. So that's what some of the things that I've been working on. Um, mm -hmm. Finally, and to, and to talk to Joni's um, question, one of the pieces of work we've been doing is trying to hire an emergency operations plan coordinator. Um, first job was to receive funding, and so um, Jim, Fenn, and I have finally secured the funding for the position. Um, last week, we interviewed a person. We've done the professional reference checks, and now I need to meet with that individual. Well, that would be the person. So we, we have the emergency operations plan drafted and complete as far as we can. That individual will review our emergency operations plan, coordinate training, offer some you know, tabletop experiences. So the role of that individual who has a law enforcement background is to really bring it to the next level. And that's when the training can occur. We have put on with the help of RAF the tab in terms of safety. So the presentation that was done at the last board meeting is up there with all the links to the pieces of the emergency operation plan that can have public viewing, like what are the protocols, what are the practices. In addition, it has on there the monthly AMA behavior data that people were looking for. So by elementary school and by middle school and high school, what are the kinds of behaviors we're seeing and what's the frequency of those behaviors? So that's up and running. So in terms of um, what is the training, who will be doing it? I'm hoping within the next week or so, I'll be able to meet with that individual. We will offer them a position and then we can move forward and really developing that training schedule. Um, at each of our elementary schools currently, they are reviewing the um, options-based response. And so that's been something that the faculty and staff wanted to begin with. We will then, the plan is before the end of the school year, do a walkthrough of just faculty and staff on how do we uh, implement an op um, options-based plan for security. So the question, there was another question. I think that she wanted me to answer during this time or discuss. Corinne, was there about the assistant principal? Yeah, I did. And um, and actually, just um, an, another quick question um, regarding what you were just saying about uh, the info and the Alma info that's going to be up on the website, or that is, I guess, already a, a tab yes. up there. Um, yes. Can you provide a little clarity on? Um, to what extent each of the buildings is um and the leadership in the buildings is utilizing that new because i i've my understanding is that sort of a model is sort of a, a new uh plan to sort of um input all this data and then maybe there's a couple buildings that are fully on board have been doing it and then the other ones maybe not fully so can 
Can you provide a little clarity on there? Because if we're looking at data at all the schools, it may, you know, some of it may be more complete than others. Yes. So I will, what I will say is the middle school and high school have definitely embraced using online enrollment re all my reporting. I know Cody and his team have worked really hard to train and work with teachers on how, what that looks like. Um, Woodstock Elementary and Killington Elementary mm -hmm. were very familiar with those systems. Then they were PBIS schools and we're using what we call the Swiss system for student reporting. Barnard and Reading are still working on the agreements. I met with um, Melissa today from Barnard, principal there, in terms of what do we respond to? How do we, um, how we record that information? It is not that they are not recording. It is that what is the level of recording that's happening? And so I still see all of the reports that are submitted in Alma across my screen every day. And so Reading is submitting and Barnard submitting. I will say that because Killington and Wes have been doing this kind of reporting for such a long time. And again, it's our, those are our two biggest elementary schools. They are really, I think their, pro, their data and, and maybe RAF can add to it, has the highest level of fidelity as well as the middle school and high school. I think Barnard and, and Reading are, are onboarding that and are mostly reporting more than the major behaviors than the minor behaviors. Would you say that's accurate, Ron? Yeah, and, and I'd add Foster Valley is also oh, I'm sorry. doing a really yep. robust job. They've been documenting um, their yep. incidents in all of the two years now. Great. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, just the question I had um, to follow up on, you know, the board asked uh, a few meetings ago, let's, you know, one response to what's happening, what are the needs in the building at West? And I know you asked the leadership there to, to meet about that and and they uh, identified vice principal as needed and that um, that had gone to the finance committee to look at that. I was just curious sort of, uh, and then I and then I think that the job was posted perhaps. Um, just curious how that process and, and if there are more steps of that process in terms of Board of approval of a new position, um, given that it's something that wasn't in the budget, or it's does it come under? I mean, I have a couple of the pieces of the sort of fiscal management policy here, but um, does it come under a piece of the policy where the full board doesn't have to approve that as an addition um, to the budget, or can you speak to that? Because I would I would normally have thought that a new position, administrative position would be something that the board would, full board would be looking at. And I know that we did ask, you know, to look into this, um, but just curious on that. Sure, Maybe. I can speak to that. I, I, mean, I recall yep. putting the policy in place. Uh, this is, you know, four or five years ago, uh, prior business operations manager. And the idea on the policy uh, was to provide guidelines for the for the uh, expenditures at the school district level. And the first, um, I guess we had the policy in front of us, we could look at it, but it's essentially uh, the superintendent or uh, delegate of the superintendent uh, is empowered to spend in accordance with the budget, right? And then there are some parameters around um, swapping uh, line, item, line item expenditures within the budget. I believe it's like 50% of a category within the budget can be exchanged with another one um, without board approval. Or you can add new, that's another parameter, is you can add new spend up to $25,000 without board approval. That's all within the superintendent's authority. I can tell you what happened at the finance committee meeting, and that was I turned to Jim Ben and said, can we find this money in the budget under, under um, the, the first kind of premise, which is superintendent and superintendent's delegate are empowered to spend money in accordance with the budget. Is there 100% fidelity to the line item budget? No, you could make an argument that, that no, maybe we should have brought that back to the board. It's certainly within the board's purview to approve that. And if we want to do that as a, as a board action, that's probably a good idea once it's identified where the budget that money will come from, um, or if it needs to be excess spending, the, the board would vote on it. But I think those are all potential pass forward. It's not um, you know airtight. The, the, the policies really come in the form, as I said, of guidelines, and they're kind of general operating principles, I think, given the uh, urgency of the situation and you know the pressures that um, we all, I think, were feeling um, and the rec clear recommendations of the superintendent, that was why the finance committee took the action that it did. And the timeline. Right now, this is hiring time for principals and administrators. 
we really wanted to make sure if this was the position, the direction the board wanted us to move, we had to move really quickly to post it. And as a result, we received, I think, over 10 different, 10 to 15 applications for the position. And so the next step is there has been a committee brought together, which includes a board member, which includes a community member, faculty, administration. Um, they will review the resumes, um, determine who to interview. I think that's happening within the next few weeks. And then a recommendation for hire will be brought to me after the um, reference checks are made. And that's and how to hire, a hire to begin for FY24. Correct, correct. Yeah, I mean, I think I, the, it all sounds perfectly reasonable and, and prudent and, uh, you know, important to me. And I think that um, if we can hear, maybe if the full board could hear from Jim Fenn, you know, sort of how that was, that money was located and or what the effect is on the budget, it would be, um, you know, informative for us. And there's Jim, and I know that's his plan for next Monday night, right, Jim? It is my plan for next Monday night. Uh, quickly, uh, working with Sherry, though, what we've done is for next year, we're probably looking at reallocating some of the ESSER funds to this position next year, and then working with the board, putting it into the budget for the following year. Because that's about, that's what, that's where the funds are. We don't have enough money sitting around to fund it without, you know, tapping one of our other sources. Right. Yeah, and so that's is be important to know because the ESSER funding obviously is a is uh, not something that goes on, and so the board will be looking at that. You know, if Ab it's a position that needs to be sustained. Absolutely, because the ESSER fund will sunset uh, September of twenty five, so we have really one more year to spend the money, and then we, if this is the way you want to go, which uh, at the moment it, it appears it is then we'll need to make sure we include it in next year's budget presentation. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? Sherry, yes, first. Um, going back to the security plan, um, again, another thank you, right? I know the security plan itself didn't exist to this extent a couple of years ago. It's a lot of work, hundreds of pages. There's a lot, there's a lot going on there. Um, and it sounds like there's a plan in place. That being said, I just want to, you know, acknowledge the fact that Joni did come tonight. I don't know if uh, she or others are aware of the plan, so I would just encourage additional communication and maybe thinking about some kind of base level training or something that could, could be provided as a stopgap between now and then, or at least you know expectations of timelines and, and things like that, so they, they feel more comfortable between now and a few months from now when we have somebody onboarded that's going to start the training. Because it's been to happen two weeks from now. We want them to feel as good as they can, knowing that there's more to come. Thank you. Good point. All right. I think we can move to the next report, which would be to that. Good evening, everyone. I'll, I'll be brief. Uh, for those of you who haven't met, uh, my name is Raphael. I'm the Governor's Director of Technology and Innovation. Um, two things I wanted to highlight tonight. First, I wanted to recognize uh, Joyce U. Babbitt. She is our, she's a new library media specialist at Woodside Elementary, Prosper Valley, and Reading Elementary School. Joyce, uh, upon joining us, immediately upon joining us, uh, developed a podcast um, where she features uh, students sharing their favorite books. And this has grown slowly over the course of the year. And this past week, she was featured um, on Vermont Public Radio for an interview for 15 minutes explaining how this grew and, and how this came to be. So I just wanted to let all of you know and, and acknowledge her and her work. Um, it's been really exciting to see this grow. Um, she worked with a couple other folks, uh, including Rhiannon Hutchinson, our grants manager, and Allison Babbitt to secure a grant from Consolidated Communications for $5,000 to support this program. Um, it's been really exciting to see this grow. Um, I know some of you have seen your children featured in that, and it's it, it's very exciting. Um, so I want to recognize Joyce for that. And the second piece was um, we've been working our way through our rewiring project of all of our of all of our schools. Um, so we finished rewiring Barnard Academy, and then over February break we rewired Reading Elementary School. Um, and so we're we're getting all those systems up online. Um, next will be Killington 
elementary school, and then Woodstock Elementary School will be last over the summer. Um, so this is a project which is funded through NASER to really help shore up our basic technology infrastructure across all of our schools. Any questions for Rob? Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Shana Kalitsky for the student uh, director of student support services. <laughs> Hi, good evening. I'm Shana Kalnitsky, and I'm going to choose to highlight a few of the things that I've mentioned I work on, but I didn't get to really talk about in detail. And it was just mentioned that this is a big time of year for staffing, and we all know how difficult the job market is. And I've been spending quite a bit of time investing uh, time in finding quality people. I, I don't choose to have a passive stand and wait for people to apply for job postings, um, even though that's a very visible way of finding people. But I like to think of myself as procuring excellent uh, staff by connecting with potential staff members through our own educators, resourcing with people who I know across the state, and also asking um, current staff to refer good people they know to our job opportunities. So what am I hoping to do by that? I think that beyond the requisite certifications or licenses that uh, an applicant might have, I like to consider what assets might a new employee bring to a school team so that the staffing decisions I've made with the folks that I've brought on since September were done with the goal of bringing new assets or skills, not only to support the students in the building, but also to support the school teams, meaning the educators and the administrators. And although my title is called the Interim Director of Student Support Services, I really take seriousness in my role, role and responsibilities on focusing on supporting the educators who are on the ground with the students each day. I spent the last several weeks working with Jim Fenn and Rhiannon Hutchinson on a new grant submission that would focus on ongoing training and support for all teachers to create strong communities in their classrooms, uh, help students learn about stress and work through it, and also complement the social emotional curriculum second step that we're currently using in our elementary schools. We spend a great deal of time talking about our multiple tiered systems of support or MTSS practices with regard to academics, but this is another way to balance the focus not only on the academics, but on the social, emotional, and the behavioral health of our students. All right, are there any questions for Shana? Thank you, Shana. And uh, now we have our Curriculum Instruction and Assessment Director Report. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jen Stainton. I'm the Director of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, otherwise known as the CIA. Um, I've been in the district for 15 years as a high school science teacher, as a high school curriculum director, and now in this position as our district came together as a curriculum coordinator for the district. I'm also a parent of twin juniors who you heard from tonight, and they are here by choice from the town of Sharon. Um, I wanted to say a uh, hearty welcome to new board members, and I decided to use this month's board report as an opportunity to frame some of the work of the CIA for you, the newest board members. However, some of this framing is going to be good for board members who came through the year last year and maybe a nice refresher for folks who have been here for a while. Um, within the report, I included links to the CIA webpage, which is on the SU website. And within that page, you can find all kinds of great information that's helpful to you as a board member as people from the community come and speak to you around questions they have related to um, anything related to curriculum instruction or assessment. Um, I also provided information about our district's literacy goals and direction. So this year, all teachers, principals, interventionists, and special educators in grades pre-K to four have been engaging in over 70 hours of job embedded professional development around the science of reading with our very talented literacy instructor, uh, Julie Brown. This is one of the many actions we're taking to reach our goal. And our goal is to have 90% of Windsor Central Supervisory Union students proficient or above proficient in reading by the end of grade three and to remain proficient or above beyond grade three. We're in the midst of a selection process for our new ELA curriculum, 
And as Sherry mentioned earlier, a redistribution of teaching time to ensure any new curriculum has a precious resource of time to help ensure our literacy goals are met. In the report, I also provided links to our mission, vision, and goals for mathematics. Our math mission is to cultivate mathematicians who believe that math is logical, useful, and that perseverance will lead to mathematical success and joy. And to that end, this year, teachers of math in grades 5 through 12 are creating district-wide math agreements for instructional alignment, and they're using a core resource titled the Math Pact, and that's being led by our district math facilitator, Patty Kelly. On that webpage also is a link to our district's universal assessment calendar, and um, that's linked in the board packet as well. All of these things are linked for easy access so you can see them. Um, and I wanted to encourage you to reach out to me anytime if you have questions around curriculum instruction and assessment, and please check out our CIA webpage. Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much, Jen. Um, and before the students, um, Jerry, can I ask oh, Jen yes, question? sorry. Yes. Jen, I'm just looking at the 90% goal for, for literacy. I think um, just could you ground us on maybe where we are and how bold of a goal that is? It's a really bold goal. Um, we are not near that just yet. Um, however, that goal was written by our teachers who really want to make sure we get there. And they feel like the training they're receiving from Julie Brown is an excellent step towards that. Great. So we have to say, this is, okay, if you wanna hear something really sad, we have the second highest literacy rate in the state with a proficiency rate around 65%. Okay, so that's like a You know, and, and you know, we can talk about, you know, the NAEP scores around 50, like half. And, and myself and Julie and Audrey were at a film Saturday night talking about the, how appalling it is in the United States that we have such low proficiency rates. So it's bold. We're going to take a step. We're going to change our practices. We're changing our curriculum. We're not waiting for the agency of education to tell us how to do it because we know how to do it. And we are going to be a leader in the state in terms of proficiency, both in literacy and mathematics. Um, and that's where we're putting, you know, if you want to know where we're putting our ESSER money beyond facilities, it's in making sure that our students and, and it addresses, equity addresses student behavior. If you don't feel like you have the skills to be successful in your class with literacy and mathematics, how do you belong? And that's that's where we're at, and that's how we're moving forward. So it's exciting, and you know I've got a great team with Jen and Audrey and Julie and Japan, and it's just a, a powerful team that are as committed to hitting that goal. And that's how we are serving our communities and serving our students to make sure this happens. So awesome. We like Hi, we like bold goals. <laughs> uh, quick question. Yes. Um, Jen, can you talk about? why the state dropped SBAC testing. It's been around for a while. My kids have gone through it a bunch of times. So um, what, what exactly happened there? What, why did they just drop it? I actually think Raph could speak to that more because he's uh, interacted mm -hmm. with the AOE more than I have about it. Um, I don't really know. Um, <laughs> what they've said is that they um, believe that this new test cognia will be have better equity measures and they will incorporate equity into it more. Um, that's all. <laughs> you know, there's, there's some stories that, you know, SBAC gave everybody a great deal to begin with, and the costs mm -hmm. were going to go up really fast. I mean, there's lots of stories running around, and districts really didn't know. We didn't know until what, November? Yeah, it came right. yeah, very late. Um, I think we have to find out from October November that everyone can be doing this back. And we we received the manuals for the new tests about two weeks ago, um, which is about four months or five months after we would normally expect. I can add a few details to that as well, because we were just getting the special education staff ready um, to um, prepare the student IEPs for this. And in um, a quote from Dan French, the Secretary of Education, he said that Cognia's approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the development and implementation of assessments aligns with Vermont's values and the accessibility and user experience of their testing resources will make working with the assessments easier for students, families, and educators, 
Some other details were that there will be multiple translations and accommodations for all types of learners. There will be a diverse group of reading selections and authors for the exam passages where there were not in the past. And also of note, there will be one assessment in each area for ELA, math, and science, when in the past there were two separate assessments for each of those areas. And they also expect that the test is expected to be shorter than the SBAC, but they won't know that definitively until the students are actually taking the tests this year. Thank you. All right. Well, state does love its tests. <laughs> That's through quite a few generations myself. Um, okay. Um, before um, the student representatives, representatives to the board make their report, I wanted to just um, say that um, recently uh, the school board chair, I think Ben, you got it as well, a letter from a student in Windsor who uh, was asking all school board in the state of Vermont to uh, make sure that there is student voice represented at the table. And he was hoping to get um, a lot of uh, momentum around that. And I don't know where it went, but after thinking about that quite a bit and recognizing how much time Aiden and Owen have given to this board and how much we've appreciated them, I thought that we could uh, take a step here at our board and appoint them as um, official school board members because of their age, they cannot vote <laughs> and uh, probably not participate in the executive sessions, but um, they have the opportunity where in the past they just sat on Zoom and waited for public comment if they wanted to make a comment. They have the uh, opportunity to ask questions here um, as every school board member has the opportunity and introduce topics of discussion um, or to explain and clarify things. And so um, I thought that it would be an opportunity for our board to practice inclusion and also recognize them for what they've done. And at some point we probably do need to um, put together a process for how they would be succeeded. And I, I may invite the students to, to work on that as well. Um, but for now, I thought it was the right thing to do as we're reorganizing our board. So I would um, uh, invite a nomination of both Aiden um, Corsi and, uh, sorry, Aiden Chiavella and Owen Corsi to be appointed to the school board as student representatives. Do you need a motion? Yes. I would be honored to welcome you to the board. I think that you'll get the same reception from everybody else. And you've actually inspired my son who's 10. He's excited to be part of you. So yeah, that's my motion. Second. I happily second. <laughs> okay, I happily it... third. <laughs> Is there any further discussion? Uh, question. Yes. Ms. Lord, I'll finish. Go um, I think you guys are great. And I also signed the petition from the Windsor student when he sent it. So I think it's a great idea. Um, if we appoint tonight, it, are we putting a term on it? Because That's a good question. I think that we should probably maybe make it a one-year term and then use this year to work out the process. One year from? No, good year. One year from right now? Or the end of the school year? No, I think from we should go out like our terms through March to March. Just for clarification, you said they wouldn't be allowed to vote because of their age. If we get students who are eighteen, would they be voting? That's I don't know. I don't think I don't think students can actually vote. Uh, do you mind if I cool. we looked into this quite a bit and just a little plug for anybody who wants to be in communications and join Sam, who does a fantastic job, mostly sends things out. But originally created that one of the goals was actually to figure out to work with the policy committee to create policy to invite students, faculty, and other community members to become board representatives. That has never happened. So if anybody's interested in that work, talk to Carrie. Yes, That's please. The place to be. The, I'm the, uh, the only person. On the communication the board. Legally, legally, the only people that can vote on a school board are the people that were elected by their towns. So, no matter what, if there's faculty or other members, they'll never be able to vote. 
but it's that being able to speak to these topics, I think is huge because we usually have to say, wait till the end of the meeting for that 10 minute section or something. So being able to actually invite them to, to speak the entire meeting, I think is kind of a, a big benefit to it. So. Any other comments, questions? All right, looks like we're ready to vote. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, you are officially appointed student members of the board and glad to have you here. And now you will give the report. All right. I'll start off. Um, I'll just start by saying uh, thank you, Carrie, and thank you, everyone. Um, but I know we're both Owen and I are very happy to be on this board and to share our perspective on um, student life and um, student opinion. Um, I'll start. I know uh, Sherry touched on this a little bit, um, but high school sports, winter sports have been going really well. Um, they're pretty much over, aside if you like some of our um, athletes are going to outside of school competitions. We've had a lot of successes and a lot of uh, championships, um, and we're really proud of that. And that makes way for our spring sports season starting, where a lot of um, a lot of teams are meeting, um, meeting to you know organize seasons, organize fundraisers. And um, it's really great to see that go in motion. Um, also, we uh, the student council. There's been some uh, good events. The student councils are hosting. We have. Um, that's Wednesday assembly, I believe. Uh, this week, Owen can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, we will also be having a lip sync battle coming up in the next few days. We had that pre COVID, but that was kind of shut down when we went to lockdown and we're starting that back up again. It's just good to see um, that start up, and a lot of students are very happy and have high morals about that. Um, the third quarter uh, ends on Friday, March 31st, and a lot of students are preparing for SATs, AP exams. Uh, I would say SBACs, but that is not around anymore. <laughs> so uh, yeah, a lot of there's a lot of academic, um, big academic crunch coming up, and a lot of students are getting prepared for that. Um, and just to finish off my part, uh, some high school, middle school students, including Owen and myself, have been working on uh, presentations for um, students in our district and beyond. Um, I know um, coming up, we have a presentation to the Vermont Association for Middle Level Educators. Um, that's an annual con conference in Burlington, and we'll be presenting our work with the uh, student manifesto that we presented earlier and also doing a workshop with middle school students and we are very happy to also have middle school students in our district working with us on that. Same stupid thing. Um, so Aiden and I, along with both the Stainsons, will be going, and they're not there anymore, but we'll be going on Thursday to Burlington to present to some middle school age kids on that. Our team has collaborated a lot with our Nubu lab director at the high school, Sumanth Krishna, and um, middle school science teacher, Ryan Becker, to create a guided workshop. Um, and we'll present on this document and we'll do some, some different work around equity and, and leadership for those kids. Um, we're doing similar presentations like this to, to the faculty, to administrators, as Ms. Susa mentioned, um, and to the board, of course. Um, and we're definitely, I would say, to add eager, what I've heard from other high school students, we're pretty eager to talk about the high school middle school mascot. So I, I know um, Ms. Bristow emailed us earlier this month about that. And I think the configuration and enrollment working group should uh, to get going on that soon. I think we're ready. So, yeah. All right. Any questions for our student representatives? No. Well, thank you very much and welcome. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next thing we're going to move into our committee updates, finance committee. Yeah. Um, so since our last board meeting, uh, kind of the run up to town meeting, I want to thank uh, board members, members of the administration who helped out with some of our uh, budget presentations in different towns. Elliot and uh, Plymouth did a great uh, presentation there. Uh, 
Bryn, Bryce, and Barnard. I think that was a, a well received presentation. More board members in attendance than uh, community members, but uh, it's all good. Um, the, the senior center, uh, we had a great presentation there. Uh, Sherry and Carrie and I, a uh, good group uh, gathered. Um, and uh, I guess uh, Bridgewater had some had some fireworks. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, the, the, the votes are in, and I think our, as you, for just to anybody who hasn't actually looked at the numbers, uh, Article 2, the budget itself passed overwhelmingly 960 to 459. Um, Article 7, the, um, the work on uh, towards the uh, middle school, high school, new bill uh, passed by about 59%, 857 to 603. Um, uh, the, the two construction articles, the upgrades to the, the uh, steam system, uh, was the biggest landslide of a vote over a thousand people, 1040 to 421, and then the uh, Killington roof, uh, 689 to 438. I'm overjoyed. I think that um, all members of the Finance Committee likely are, and as uh, all board members, we should be as well to see that much support from our communities, uh, particularly where we itemized you know, each of these things this year and gave community members the choice. And I think one of the things that we see coming through is, uh, at least personally, one of the things I feared was, well, why should someone in, in Reading or Plymouth care about a roof at Killington, right? But voters are starting to, to get it, I think. And may, maybe they always have, and we just, we just fear these things. But in kind of this post Act 46 consolidation, maybe it's the rebranding work, who knows? But it, we feel like we're really kind of coming together and um, you know identifying as, as a district. So that's great. We'll continue to um, you know kind of take that forward, and I'll have I guess more updates uh, on the uh, working group updates for um, a new bill when we get there. I'd like to say a big thank you both to Ben and uh, Jim. Uh, I know you're remote uh, for all of the work that y'all did um, during this budget season. It's been incredible. Yes. <laughs> And I'd like to say that I think that the conversations around we are a district and we support each other's schools needs to keep continuing because I did get some emails and some conversations, not that many, but it was enough to make me realize people still aren't 100% sure who's paying for which school and that we are all paying for all schools. And it's brought a lot of good improvements that some um, were unable to do on their own. And that's the point that I made with people that. It really helps the smallest schools to be able to do the, the projects that cost the same, whether you know you're one school or another. So the more we can do as board members talking to our constituents to just keep emphasizing that we, you know, we are working together for all schools um, and that we do see the need for equity across them and we're addressing those things. As far as resources go, I think that would be very great if you have those conversations. All right, the policy committee. Yep. So uh, we have uh, one policy to bring up for a second reading. That's a school crisis prevention and response policy. Just a reminder, this policy is essentially a cover letter, um, essentially codifying our school emergency operations plan, which is already in place, has been for some time. Um, and as you remember, the details of the plan are confidential. We did add a special section in it to emphasize uh, community notification and, uh, and communications. Um, so this second reading has a couple of wordsmith changes just having to do with medical, uh, just a couple of terms, medical response agency, drills and exercises, and use of the word students. I would... Um, like to present it for a third reading for next month so that we can go over some more wordsmithing and clear up any uh, misperceptions or ambiguity that so we would like to bring it back one more time and hopefully we'll turn on the policy committee next week and is your intent that you'll that we will vote it on it at the third reading we'll try. Uh, well um or would we just wait until the next we can try. Okay. So <laughs> I, that is the intention to get it all. Uh, I mean, we we just okay. would like to make sure we have everything. And everybody's happy with it, um, but uh, we're getting there. Okay. But I would like to present it tonight because we had these. Uh, I'd like to move it forward with the uh, things that Anna suggested. So, yes. Do, well, what's the? It sounds like you're pretty confident there's going to be changes. So no, there may not be changes. So just all the assumption. Assumption. 
to, to, yeah. to adopt at the next at the next meeting. If we can get a second, if we can, and then if we if we decide not to, we can always push it again. Okay. But if we don't do that, then that's no, we won't, we won't no, it has to do with the fact that I know what that also is in store of the policy committee. And if we get into a lot of wordsmithing on it next time, it's going to be difficult. But um, and just thinking so, so I brought it to the leadership team. Principals had some questions, so I encourage principals to attend the policy committee next week. So there was an opportunity to have a discussion between the policy committee and principals, and I think that was the piece. And rather than me being the person in the middle, I really felt that that conversation was important. So that's fine. If you, yeah, we can get. If we can't make it, then then we'll then we'll table it and bring it back at another time. But that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Oh, second. Can you tell us, uh, since we have new, new board members and myself as well, um, how can we best support you to get it to a good space for the next meeting? Um. Because it sounds like you want you want suggestions, but maybe not wordsmithing edits, so that we're digging into the weeds of which words to use. I think we just have to look at it globally. I mean, we'll discuss it at the meeting, but I think we just have to look at it globally. That it is not a, not intended as a micromanagement policy. It's a global policy. It is not intending to supersede anything that is in a handbook or or the or the judgment of any principal or anything else. It's really just an over arching policy and it's using terms that are actually suggested by the crisis policy of Vermont. The terms are verbatim. We just changed a couple of other things and your changes were, you know, just so no, 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 that was fine. That's fine. But um, it's not, um, it's, I think that's the main, and I think that's where we're going to uh, talk about at the policy committee that it really is an overarching policy and it's not, um, superseding anything else Received. thank you yeah all right um so we probably need a motion don't we to we have a motion one second we call the question all in favor all right okay very good um buildings and grounds sure. evening for uh, the new folks who don't know me i'm joe goley and i'm the facility director here for uh, Central. Uh, just a brief update. Uh, last week, uh, we completed our final three assessments of all our buildings. So the state has come through, audited, and assessed all our buildings. We hope to have a report on all our buildings soon. Uh, they issued a preliminary one and needed to go back for some revisions. Uh, hope to have that in the next few weeks. Uh, <clears throat> thank God we passed. Um, we got the funding for our two projects. So I'm excited that we did sign contracts for both of those projects. And over the next few weeks, I'll be meeting with the contractors who will be doing the new roof and the system upgrade here at the high school. And we'll get a schedule and uh, get the ball rolling. We have a very small window to get both of these projects done. So it's crucial that uh, we get our ducks in a row. That's all I got for you. Can we have a motion to send Joe home? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, negotiation. Um, well, just, just because we have a bunch of new members, um, you know, the main function of this group is to, to, to negotiate with, with a couple different unions, right? For the, the educators and for the support staff. Uh, we just wrapped up support staff negotiations on a three year contract starting in just, just a couple months ago. Uh, the teachers will be starting to have this conversation again in the, the fall, I think. So um, that's kind of the schedule that we're on. That was a three year, that's that name. It doesn't always have to be three years, so though. That's part of negotiation, right? But the hope is that we'll be starting those talks with, with um, educators this, this fall for that, that next round. Hopefully, you're sooner rather than later, actually, so we can we can budget accordingly. So we've had some preliminary emails just to start that planning process. And that is a committee, a, work, a committee now, a working group that does need members, along with Sam. Poor Sam up there, all by herself on the communications committee. And he comes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, I. I I mean it hasn't been a lot, but if you guys want to add more to it, then yeah, I'd love to have more people on the communications committee. But I think that it will now. become bigger because okay. of the need to communicate <laughs> about the new okay. build and that type of thing. So those people that love words and enjoy putting together um, bursts of information that go out in various ways, um, that's a great committee for people like that. So. 
Um, are there any working group updates? Other working group updates? I'll do it for new bill. We, we actually haven't met as a new bill committee in a year. Uh, there really hasn't been much to meet about without any uh, funding, but now there's funding. There's lots of reasons to meet. Um, so let uh, our architects, uh, LaValle and Renzinger, uh, know, you know about the results of the voting, and we'll fire up the uh, new bill working group to meet monthly um, for the next, you know, for the foreseeable future. So that's wonderful. And uh, we'll have some published uh, agendas and schedules coming out soon. And you'll be looking for a board member or two? Uh, I think so. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody wants to be involved as well? Okay. All right. Um, then I think we're at the consent agenda. Um, Motions to adopt the yeah. consent agenda. It's basically, sets of minutes. It's not got anything else in there that isn't a minute as I look through it. Uh, all right. All in favor of accepting the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Thank you. Um, and is there any um, further public comment? Ray. Oops, sorry. I wanted to make sure that we recognize right. Chloe Masillo, who took a second place in the state slalom race for your school, Woodstock Union High School. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks for that, Ray. Um, then at this point, we will be going into an executive session to discuss student matters and make the motion. Is there an executive session? Okay. All in favor of going into executive session? We will be excusing some folks at this time. Yeah. All right. We are now back in session at 9 37 p.m. Um, I, I do have one thing to say. Like now that we're out of executive session before we get out entirely. Um and maybe I need to just address this to policy. Maybe I need to attend the next policy meeting. Um, in the couple of times that we've had interactions with the HHB policy, I I would like to take another look at that policy, specifically the part where it says that in order for an HHB violation to have occurred, there needs to be an educational impact on the alleged victim. Um, I feel like that should be broader because just looking at grades and attendance does not encompass the whole person and bullying can happen to very high performing students and they're still just you know crumbling inside and we need to support that as well so I I want to say that that we haven't been using a very strict um interpretation of HHB to try to ignore victimization but I want to make sure that that never happens that we're just like well oh, sorry your grades are fine your your attendance so we don't have to do anything about this that's just something I want to throw out there and it might be good for administration to talk about how that's interpreted so there's the law and then what's the interpretation of that law when investigations occur and HHB so what that was approved is the actual law in the state of Vermont. So that was not written by our policy. It was approved as a VS Vermont School Board Association recommended policy. What about questioning the, uh, again, the procedure. Two, two time, can we, but that's exactly it. The so procedure. Procedures was, that are associated with a policy, yeah. Yeah. they might be more work to look at those if the, if the policy is just a legal document more than anything. I think I do need to say that we took no action in executive session, and now um, we could have a moment of reflection on our, our meeting tonight, then. I just want to say nice job to the new board members, Josh Ryan, actively participating, Marianne, good comments. John, I know it's coming. I know it's coming. <laughs> we typically end earlier than 9.40. Yes, we do. <laughs> Can you need a motion to adjourn? I will make that motion. Second. All in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 How's it looking at? Can I come back? Uh, it's coming down. No, sure. Not, not really gathering on the